Hi everyone, in this activity we're going to look at learning more about ggplot2. So specifically, uh, we're going to start by looking at conducting exploratory data analysis in R using the glimpse function and the skim function. We'll look at how we can create scatter plots again using the geom point function and how we can add smooth curves or straight lines of best fit using the geom smooth function. We'll look at how we can apply bundled themes to ggplot data visualizations. Uh, so if we want to customize things like the title font, um, the coloring scheme of everything in the plot, um, grid lines in the background of the plot, those types of things, instead of always modifying plots in the same way, you can have a preset a uh, set of customizations of your plots that you bundle into what are called themes. And so other people have made themes available that they like to use, sets of pre-made customizations for ggplot objects. And so we'll look at how we can take advantage of those. We'll also look at how we can specifically tweak specific theme elements. Uh, so for example, maybe we like the whole theme that we've applied uh, but we want the font or the overall title to be a little bit bigger, um, or we want to bold that title, things like that. Uh, we'll look at how we can specifically modify theme elements to customize our ggplot2 data visualizations. Uh, we'll look at how we can create bar charts with ggplot2. And then we'll also look at what's called faceting of ggplots which is essentially breaking up a plot into multiple subplots based on an additional variable. So it's a way in which we can add further dimensions or variables to our plot. So for example, we could facet a scatter plot based on a grouping variable into three sub scatter plots that will all have a consistent uh, y axis to compare across them. So that process of breaking up a plot into multiple subplots it's called faceting. And then separately, we'll look at how we can combine or concatenate ggplots into one single image using the patchwork package. So this package is really great if you have, say, two ggplots that you've created, two separate plots, and you want to just um, concatenate or stick them on top of each other and have that be one single image. Or maybe you have three plots and you want that in a single row, all concatenated side by side. Or three in the top, one wide plot in the bottom. Okay, anything like that where we're combining multiple data visualizations into one single image can be efficiently done with the patchwork package. So the first thing we're going to do for this activity uh, is open up a new R Markdown document. So we'll go File. New file, R Markdown. I'm going to knit to HTML. That always has the least issues. Okay. Get rid of the template code. OK. Now, first thing we're going to do is copy all of these, this code for loading all the packages we'll need. Okay. So we'll create a new chunk so first. Load necessary packages for this activity. Okay. Oops. So you may need to install these packages using install.packages. And then say, if you need the GG themes package, you can install it like this and submit that to the console. Otherwise, make sure that runs OK. All right, and we've loaded all the packages we need. So make sure to run this chunk so that we don't run into issues later. All right. 
So talking a bit about the data set we're going to be working with here in this activity. So uh, this is a data set from the Framingham Heart Study, uh, which is a real life longitudinal public health study conducted in Framingham, Massachusetts. So this study first began in 1948 in which they recorded a bunch of information about residents of this city in Massachusetts. So it's a longitudinal study, we would call it, because they're following them across time, across many years uh, moving forward. So this study is unique in that it's multi-generational, in that the original residents they started following, uh, they also have data on their children now and their grandchildren even as well. So several generations in this longitudinal study, which is pretty unique. So the main purpose of this Framingham Heart Study was to explore risks or possible causes of cardiovascular disease. Uh, so heart disease, um, issues with lungs, things like that. But over time, the study has evolved uh, to analyze more broadly um, familial trends in cardiovascular disease, but also just many diseases in general, as they've collected so much data on people starting from very early on in their lives and then as they progress um, through aging. Okay. Also more recently, although genetics data wasn't really available until uh, about the 90s or early 2000s uh, more widely, they've also collected genetics data uh, on these participants to explore potential associations with genetic traits and disease outcomes. So notably about this study, as with many public health uh, studies that have been conducted in the past, uh, the original sample, the participants were not very representative of the United States as a whole. So they were very uh, white and many males. Uh, but to improve uh, the representativeness of the sample to better be able to generalize the results to the broader population, um, the organizers of the Framingham Heart Study have expanded uh, the set of participants to have a more uh, diverse uh, population so that the understanding of etiology for many diseases is applicable uh, and more representative uh, for the general US population. So first, we're going to start by loading this Framingham Heart Study dataset um, from the risk communicator package using this code below. So one thing to note, I would take this part with the question mark and move it and just submit it into the console instead. This will bring up a help file for the data set, uh, which can provide additional information about it. So packages can have functions or sometimes data sets. Typically, you use help files to look at functions, like say the help function for uh, the help file for the count function. This tells you more about that function. In this case, we're learning more about the data set itself. Okay, so it tells us more background about the data and then number of rows, number of columns, but then also descriptions of each of the variables. So the, the data set just has the variable names, but what's very helpful is having uh, more specific descriptions of these things. So for example, cur smoke represents whether or not that participant is a current smoker, with zero being not smoker, one being a current smoker, okay, things like that. Okay, so we can knit this to look at the results from glimpse. Right. 
So we can see that all of the variables in this data set are doubles, numeric type variables, but they're not all really quantitative variables. So for example, the smoking status is a binary categorical variable and uh, sex is also a categorical variable, but yet it's encoded as a double um, because these are numbers. This is common to encounter this type of encoding of data. Um, it's more one reason, uh, probably the most likely reason is that this is efficient for data entry. So as people enter this data manually, they just have to hit the number one or two on the keyboard rather than typing out the word um, male or female, yes or no for smoking status, things like that. All right, so um, Glimpse gives us a good picture at that. Uh, we also notice that we have these messages from loading the packages, but we probably want to suppress those just because they're not very important. Um, so we can suppress that as a reminder by adding in the setup chunk, adding the global chunk options, message equals false and warning equals false. We add those messages and remit the document. We can see those messages are now suppressed. All right. So now we're going to select the first 10 variables uh, from the Framingham data set and create a new subset of the data. Since we have so many variables, uh, we're going to trim it down a little bit to make this a little bit easier to work with. Okay. So next we subset to only We'll call this Framingham sub. And we'll pipe this into the select function. So the select function is useful from the dplyr package, the select function is useful um, for re retaining only a certain set of variables or columns from a data set or data frame. So in this case, we're gonna want to retain the first 10 columns. So one way to do that is to use a vector of the numbers one through 10. Although this method is not ideal uh, because generally the position of the columns in the data set could change as we manipulate a data set with our analyses. So what's considered better practice in general is to select the variables based on the name of the columns. Okay, so in this case, the first variable is rand ID. And the 10th variable is diabetes. So instead, we'll do it like this, just to prevent potential issues. Okay. So this allows us to select the first 10 columns. Here we can see when we create that subset, there's only 10 variables now instead of 39. All right. OK, so now next, we are going to modify the sex variable to have the values of male and female rather than one and two, the numbers, so that it's more descriptive when we create visualizations in our plots. Okay. So we can do this um, by piping this into the mutate function. So mutate is a useful function for, uh, from the dplyr package 
uh, for adding new variables or modifying existing variables in our data set. Okay. So in this case, we're going to modify an existing variable in our data set, the sex variable. So we'll say sex equals and then case underscore when. So we're using this case when function. Another one that we'll revisit again. Um, it allows us to conditionally assign values to a new variable that we're creating or modifying. Okay. So here, what we're doing is if the sex variable had a value of one, we're gonna change that to the string male. If it had a value of two, we're going to change that to the string female. So how we can do this is case when we say sex equals equals one tilde male. So what's happening here is R is creating a logical or Boolean value here. So it's either true or false. If it's true on the left side of the tilde inside case when, it returns what's on the right side. If it's false, it does not return what's on the right side. And so it skips to the next line. So we'll copy this. And now if sex equals equals two, this will evaluate to female. Okay. Now this should work for this data set. Um, since there are only males and females in this data set. Um, but in general, we need to catch or uh, consider every possible scenario uh, when using the case when function. So as I mentioned, this evaluates to a Boolean. If it's true, it would assign the value of male and stop considering that specific instance. And then if it's false for the first line, it would go to the next line, see then if sex is equal, equal to two, and return female if that's true. If it's false, we need a case to capture when these first two statements are false. So what we do is we sort of hack um, a way to catch all other possible cases by just having the value true, the Boolean value true, tilde na. So this says, if it's one, make uh, update the label to be male. If it's two, update the label to be female. That was the only cases in this data set. So then we just say, if it was a missing value pretty much or anything else, make it a missing value. Now, you would think this would work, uh, which is what I initially thought. Although R doesn't like this because it wants consistent types in the values that are returned from case one. So this is a string, this is a string. It wants this to be a string, but R doesn't uh, recognize this as being a string. So what we have to do is do as dot character around this NA so that it's a missing character or string value rather than just a NA. For the most part, that's viewed as the same, uh, but again, R would throw an error if you just had just NA here. Um, so to avoid that, we use this as dot character function. Okay. All right. So if we run this, this creates this new variable, uh, replacing the old version of that. And we can see here now it says male or female, okay. which matches the pattern in the original data set, just like we wanted. All right, so we did that for the sex variable. We also want to do this, a similar concept for the current smoking status. So current smoking status, we'll copy this case when everything inside, inside of mutate here, comma. Okay. And we'll take current smoking status and replace the sex variable name here. Okay. And if we look at the help file for Framingham, we 
can see zero is not current smoker, one is a current smoker. So we'll say zero, one, so zero is no, one is yes, they are a current smoker. So we can evaluate this. And now we see in current smoking status, no, 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 no. Okay, that matches. So now we've updated these so they'll look a little bit nicer in our plots when we make them. All right. So now we'll look at using the skim function uh, to explore this subset that we just created. Signing back in. Okay. So next. All right, so if we knit that, and here we have the results from uh, the skim function. We have the two variables that we converted into character variables, uh, and then we have all the other variables in this data set. So notably, the variable with the most missing values is the total cholesterol variable. So at 409. Uh, it's good to always look at missing value patterns. So this column gives number of missing values. And then complete rate is the proportion of values that are not missing, that are complete. Um, so here we can see, even though this has the most missing values, still 96% of observations were non-missing here. Okay. Um, but if you read more into the documentation for the Framingham study, um, I believe you'll find that it's more common that children did not always have their cholesterol measured. Uh, so it's potentially the case that if you looked at the age of observations of, of participants for these observations where total cholesterol is missing, it could be that many of them are children. So that would might explain that. Uh, when you look at cigarettes per day, which is the next uh, most missingness variable, has the next most missingness, again, still 99% of the values are complete. Uh, but you notice in the data that it looks like, if you, if you look into it more, that it looks like people who do not smoke, people who are not current smokers, are more likely to have a missing value for SIG P day, which is number of cigarettes smoked per day. Okay, and so the reason being, it seems reasonable to assume if someone's not a current smoker, which we have all the information for everyone's smoking status. There's no missing values there. If someone's not a current smoker, it's reasonable to assume that their cigarettes per day is zero, even if there's a missing value there. So that's something that we won't do it here, um, but something that you could fix in the data yourself um, if you're going to analyze this whole data set. Okay. It's always good to visualize these values a bit. Um, look at patterns of missingness, things like that. All right, so now we're going to make a GG plot. So we're going to make a scatter plot between the diastolic and systolic blood pressure for each participant. 
We're going to break up or facet the plot by the sex of the participant. And then we'll also toggle um, the transparency of each point using the alpha aesthetic. Okay. And we're going to be working our way over these next few bullets here. We're going to be working our way towards recreating this faceted scatter plot here. So first, just creating a basic scatter plot between diastolic and systolic blood pressure. So we'll even make a new section, we'll call it scatter plot. And then maybe this first section we'll call exploratory data analysis. So next, we are now, we create So we start with name of the data set here, pipe that into the ggplot function, and we'll specify the x aesthetic and the y aesthetic. So typically for a scatter plot, you have x be the explanatory or independent variable, and y be the response or dependent variable. In this case, with systolic and diastolic blood pressure, there's not really a clear explanatory variable, response variable role for either of them. So we'll just make, just to choose one, we'll just make diastolic blood pressure the response variable and systolic blood pressure the explanatory. And so just with this alone, this makes a blank canvas between the two variables, but we haven't specified yet how to, or that we want a scatter plot. Okay, so to do that, we add a geome point layer. That's what adds points to the plot. So we added that. All right. And so here's where we see, because there's almost 12,000 observations in this data set, there's a lot of points that are drawn on this plot. And it's very dark in the middle here, so you can't actually see, you can't differentiate between any points. It ends up with this dark cloud. This is where the alpha aesthetic is helpful. So we're gonna manually set the alpha aesthetic to control the transparency of the points to being point two. And again, since we're manually setting this value constant across all observations, we specify this in the corresponding geome, not inside the AES function, which is where we specify aesthetics that are functions of variables in the data set. Okay. So we look at this. Now we can see we can see a little bit more detail in terms of the distribution or placement of points within this cloud with that alpha aesthetic being a little bit smaller than the default. Okay. And then lastly, we said we were going to facet by the sex of the participant. Okay, so we can do that by adding a facet layer using the facet underscore grid function. So the general syntax of the facet grid function uh, how we can use it is row variable tilde column variable. So for example, although we're just going to do the sex of the participant here, we could do uh, the sex of the participant and then the whether or not they're a current smoker as the row variable. If you see this, you can see whether or not they're a current smoker is the rows here for the subplots, the facets, and the columns are the sex of the participant. So the cross section of the two variables gives four different subplots. Okay. 
All right. But here we just want the uh, sex of the participants to specify the columns of the facet. So we can replace the row variable with a period. So that's what we want to do here. All right. So that's it for this bullet. For the next one, we want to map the number of cigarettes smoked per day, the sig p day variable, to the size aesthetic for the points. So since this is a variable in the data set that we're mapping this aesthetic to, we specify this inside the AES function rather than inside geom point. So we say size equals sig p day. And now we can see the points vary in size based on how many cigarettes uh, the person smokes per day. So with this many points, it's kind of hard to differentiate between the different sizes of the points a bit, um, but it's still adding additional information to the plot here. Personally, I wouldn't use the size aesthetic when you have this many points, but um, yeah, we're just exploring how that's an option. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is add a colorblind friendly palette and color the points based on the sex of each participant. So to do that, we will add um, inside the aesthetics function, we'll say color equals sex. And if we see how that changes, okay, it defaults to using these two colors, which are ggplot's default colors for groups that it uses. Um, we will override these and use a colorblind friendly palette by adding a scale color colorblind layer. So this is a different uh, colorblind friendly palette than we've seen before. This one, the first two colors in this palette are black and orange. You can also do scale iridis D or scale color here it is, T. And that's a different colorblind friendly palette, and that's fine. Uh, we're just using a different one here. So scale color, colorblind. That's the one we're going with. All right. So that's great. Now we're, we're getting there. We're getting closer to reproducing this plot. All right, just a couple things. Um, so next, we will position the legend at the bottom of the plot. So we will add a theme layer to this. And this theme function, as a part of this theme layer, is where we can specify or customize a lot of different aspects of the plot. So for example, if you want to customize the overall title, like the font of that, um, if you want to make all this text bold or angled in any way, um, you want to modify the position of the legend or control whether there's a legend at all. At all, uh, This can all be controlled in the theme function here. If you want to see all the options, all the possible options, you can do question mark theme to pull up its help file. Here it shows all the many different things you can customize in your ggplot. And there's so many, it even has dot, 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 because it's saying there's even more, more than is listed here that can be passed to this function. Um, so to move the legend position, move the legend to the bottom of the plot, we use the legend.position argument. Okay, legend.position equals bottom. And now it moved it from the right side of the plot to the bottom. 
So we still have a little bit more uh, of a ways to go to reproduce the plot in the document. So one thing that we should do for all plots is give descriptive axis labels and an overall title if we can. So to do that, we use the labs function. Uh, in general, so we're going to add a, a labs layer here. In general, the theme, it's best if you make the theme layer the very last layer on the GG plot. For the most part, you can interchange the order of different layers, and that's okay. It might not change the end result. Uh, sometimes it does matter, uh, but as a general rule of thumb, the theme function should always be applied last just prevents a lot of issues. So to add the labs layer, which stands for labels, we will specify a overall title for the plot, an x-axis label, y-axis label, and an overall caption that will show up at the bottom of the plot. Okay, so for the overall title, we have systolic by diastolic blood pressure. x-axis, systolic blood pressure, and really, if we look at the help file for Framingham, it's good to include units of measurement, even though this one, I forgot to include it in the image, we really should have units of measurement on the blood pressures. So systolic blood pressure, if we look at the help file, is measured in millimeters of mercury. Okay. And that's the same with diastolic blood pressure. So we'll add that into the axis labels. X is systolic blood pressure. Y is diastolic blood pressure. And then for the caption, it's data source, Framingham Heart Study, and the Risk Communicator Package. So data source, Framingham Heart Study, Risk Communicator. All right. So now if we rerun that, we can see all our labels show up. So. Again, getting very close. We're not quite there, but we're, we're almost there. Okay. So these have a straight line of best fit through the distributions of points. So we're going to add that into our plot now using Geom Smooth. Okay. So we're going to add a Geom Smooth layer. Again, uh, this can be added in before the theme. Here's where we'll do that. We can see by default, it draws curved lines through the data. They're curved a bit, but we want them to be straight lines of best fit. And we don't want any error bands, any error bands around the lines here. So we will do SE equals false. That suppresses the gray error bands around the lines. And then to make the lines straight, linear regression lines the best fit, we will say method equals LM, which is for linear model. And that fits, it implements a simple linear regression between the two variables and plots the line of best fit for each group. All right, so just a couple small things to get our plot to match this one. So notice that in the legend, 
It only shows the size of the points for the cigarette per day. The reason being, some of this information is redundant. We don't need to know about the coloring with black being female, orange being male, uh, because the facet labels already tell us which part of the plot is for males and which is for females. Okay, so this is redundant. So we can get rid of that using the guides function. So we'll add a guides layer plus. And then we say color equals false. Oops. Oh, it's guides with an S. Right. Oh, and then I forgot a plus sign here. OK. <laughs> there we go. OK, so now it just has cigarettes per day. I got rid of the color part. This still doesn't quite match, uh, and it looks a little funny, right? This is not great. So reason being is because the size aesthetic here. So anytime you specify aesthetics in the gen in the very general ggplot function, it applies all of those aesthetics to every geome, every subsequent geome that you apply. So in this case, it applies all these aesthetics to both the geome point and the geome smooth. So it made the thickness of the line be a function of the number of cigarettes per day. So the line is actually varying in thickness here somehow. Uh, it's kind of hard to distinguish there. We don't actually want that to be the case. We want just a, a single line that's constant thickness. Okay, so we can specify in the geome smooth function, we can manually set the size aesthetic to be just one. That fixes the length of the line. So there's no margin to need it then anymore um, because it's just a constant line thickness now. Okay. All right. So this nearly matches. It's just a little bit different. The gray background is a little bit different. If you really wanted to completely match that, what it requires is adding a bundled theme that comes available in ggplot2. So specifically, right before the theme element again, we'll use theme underscore bw, which is for black and white, add a plus sign. This is what sort of changes the background coloring here. Now our plot matches the one that we were working towards. So this is a pre-bundled theme. There's a few options. If you search the help file on it, you can see some other pre-bundled themes and you can try them out. Uh, you're welcome to use whichever theme you want here. So. Theme gray, theme black and white, theme line draw. There's all kinds of ones. Uh, a lot of people are a big fan of theme minimal because it draws the less lines. So if you look at it like that, it has, you know, they're all slight variations of each other. So they're not too different. Um, I'm a big fan myself of theme black and white, but yeah, maybe you'll find one that you like and you tend to tend to use that one. So nice pre-bundled themes. This is one example of it. Um, and then you can still, so this sort of applies a whole set of customizations. And then you can still my, like do minor tweaks on top of that using this regular theme function. So that's why it's important that you do it in this order rather than the other way around. You need theme after the the complete theme. All right. So that was that scatter plot. Now we will create side-by-side uh, -side box plots here. Okay. So we're going to make, uh, we're going to create box plots showing the total cholesterol 
and uh, smoking status faceted by uh, the sex of the participant again. Okay. All right, so first we're gonna make a side-by-side -side box plot where we have the response variable be the total cholesterol and the x-axis be the current smoking status. We'll make a new subsection side by So next we create side by side black spots. So we start with Framingham sub again. Make sure you don't accidentally use Framingham. Okay. We pipe that into ggplot. Okay, and then we specify our X and Y aesthetics. So the Y axis, the horizontal axis, we want to be total cholesterol. The X axis, we want to be current smoking status. Make sure your case matches. R is uh, case sensitive for variables. Okay. So again, this starts with a blank canvas. It doesn't know if we want a scatter plot or a box plot or anything. It doesn't know what we want yet. But we can make it a box plot using geom box plot. Now it'll do side-by-side -side box plots here. Oops. Um, okay, let's see what I did wrong here. Let's see. Mm. Okay, let's see. Oh, look at the help file here for Geom Boxplot. Let's see what I'm doing wrong. Hmm. Ah, I forgot the EES function here. You may have realized it. Okay, so. Uh, so yeah, so we need the X and Y specified inside the AES function inside ggplot. Okay. So yeah, there we go. All right. So we have current smoking status is the X, total cholesterol is the Y. All right. Uh, make all axis and title text bold in the plot. Okay. So. There's a few ways you could do this. One, if you just want, sometimes you want all the plot, all the text in the plot to be bold everywhere. The axis titles, the words for the categories, the uh, labels for the tick marks here, the title. Okay. If you want that to be the case, you can add a theme layer, and then we do, um, text equals element underscore text. And then we say family, or I'm sorry, face equals bold. Okay. You do that, 
Now everything's bolded. Sometimes that makes it a little bit easier to read. Okay. And then just like last time, we're going to update the labels here as well. So again, before the, the theme, the final theme layer, we will specify the, the title, x-axis, y-axis label, and a caption. So for the x-axis, we'll say current smoker. y-axis serum total cholesterol. That's where maybe, I think it says in the help file here. Yeah, serum total cholesterol, so we'll just copy it from there. The overall title, we want to say total cholesterol by smoking status. And then the caption is the same as the other one. So we'll copy that. Okay. Now if we run that, great. Now we can see all the labels are updated. And notice that they're bolded as well, because here we specified that we want all the text in the plot to be bold. Okay. All right. So next, we can add a complete theme from GG Themes, coloring the boxes based on smoking status, remove the resulting legend from that, and then also make uh, the axis titles bold, which we made everything bold already, uh, and change the font size as well. OK, so let's start with, that's a lot of things. Let's start with the complete theme from GG Themes. So GG themes here, if you go to the website linked to, there's a lot of different additional themes okay, that one can apply. I believe this one is theme 538. So let's try to apply that theme 538. So again, a complete theme you add before the regular theme call. So theme underscore five. Ah, make sure to add your plus signs everywhere you need it. All right. Yep. That was the 538 theme. Okay. Now we will color the inside of the boxes based on the smoking status. So an interesting aspect of box plots with Geom box plot is that the color of the inside of the bars is specified via the fill aesthetic. So inside the AES call up here, we can say fill equals current smoking status. And then that updates the coloring of the plots based on the smoking status. All right. Uh, let's see. Remove the legend. OK, so to remove the legend, we do this in the theme function. We say legend.position. The last time we did legend.position equals bottom to move it to the bottom. If you want to remove it completely, you do legend position equals none. Okay, now that's gone. Uh, let's see. We can also add the labels in. Oh, we already did that. Oops. I already did the labels. Okay. 
Well, let's look at this when we knit it at this point. Okay. Ah, oh, so the labels aren't showing up. Let's see what's going on with that. Okay, yeah, let's take a look. Mm. Okay, let's, after geome box plot, let's add a Colorblind friendly palette. Like this. I'm missing a plus sign probably somewhere, it seems like. No. Okay, this looks a little bit different. I think maybe there's differences in the R version. Okay. Yeah, the labels are not showing up great. I have a feeling it has to do with the 538 theme. Let's see if we pick that up. Yeah, it's 538 theme. Okay. Huh. Well, the 538 theme was messing things up. Uh, so maybe we won't use that one. We'll just use... I guess maybe differences in versions of the package have slightly different themes bundled with them. So we'll just, yeah, use this black and white theme again. Okay. Because the other one suppressed the labels for some reason. But we want these access labels. Okay. So, see, ours will end up looking a little bit different, but we're almost there. So we have current smoking status. Now we just want to, oh, okay, change the font size as well. Okay, so to change the font size, we can do we'll change the font size of the access titles. So we can do access access dot title plus element. X, and then it, we can do size. Let's make it a little bigger. Let's see how like that looks. Okay, I made like the axis labels a little bit bigger. Maybe we'll make like the yeah. We'll we'll just leave it at that. Okay. Anyway, that's how we modified the axis titles here. The size of those. Okay, and then lastly, we'll facet by the sex of the participant. So to do that, we do just like we did before, uh, where we add a facet grid layer. So we'll add it right after genome box plot. All right. So it doesn't match exactly because it's a different theme, but pretty much the same. So that's our side-by-side -side box box here. 
Now we'll make, next we'll make a line chart. So for the line chart, we're going to make uh, this plot, which shows the relationship between the average number of cigarettes smoked per day across time and the age of the participant. So you can think of this as like a scatter plot, but where the lines just connect where the points would be in like this zigzag fashion. So first, to make this line chart, okay, what we actually have to do is because there's multiple people who are, say, 40 years old in the study, okay, we need to get the average number of cigarettes smoked per day to get like this point, this hinge in the plot. And so we can actually do that inside ggplot. We can have it calculate an average number of cigarettes per day consumed at each age observed in the data set in order to create this plot. So how we're going to do that? A new section for the line chart. So how we're going to do that is we're going to start with this Framingham sub, pipe it into ggplot. So our x-axis variable is age, our y is cigarettes per day. Again, this will start with a blank canvas. And then to draw a line chart with the average cigarettes consumed per day for each age, We'll use a stat underscore summary layer. And then what we specify in here is the, well, in the AES function up here, which actually, so you can specify the AES function inside ggplot or Alternatively, you can move this inside the geome, or in this case, the stat underscore summary function. So that, that's how we'll do it here. So AES x equals age, y equals six per day. And then we have group equals sex. So we want to have a line for each group. We want to color each line based on the group. Okay, so that's all specified inside AES. And then outside that, we, outside that, we will specify um, that we want the geometry to be a line. So geom line. We want the size of each line to be fixed at one. And we want the statistic that's calculated for each group to be the mean. So the mean number of cigarettes per day at each age or each category of sex, each uh, male and females in this data set. OK. If we plot that. So stat summary is always a little bit trickier. Uh, typically what you would do, like uh, I don't have this syntax memorized. I would Google someone else's code that already works, tweak it with the variable names and such to make the line chart that I want. Okay. So this, again, ggplot automatically calculates an average at each point and then plots that across time. So next we'll apply a complete theme to the plot. So we'll do the black and white theme again. Okay. Uh, let's add la labels again. So before the theme, do labs, overall title, x-axis, y-axis and the caption 
So we'll keep the caption the same. Okay. The title, Average Cigarettes Per Day by Age and Sex. Okay. Average cigarettes per day by age and sex of the participant. Okay. And then x axis is age and years. Probably good to specify the units of measurement. Average cigarettes per day is the y. All right. Now with all our labels, uh, this line chart is on its way. Okay. So notice that this is a uh, lowercase here. So we can change that in the labs function as well with the color option. Okay. I updated that. All right, that's all our labs, all our labels. Now, I don't think I said this, but we'll use a colorblind friendly theme that matches our first original plot up here so that the color scheme is the same. Okay, so we can do that with that scale colorblind friendly uh, layer right here. Scale color colorblind. So again, we'll add that right before the complete theme. There we go. Now it's looking really close. We're almost there. Oh, uh, we just need the axis breaks. So this goes 0, 4, 8, 12, 16. Ours goes 0, 5, 10, 15, which is totally fine. Like ggplot does a good job at automatically picking where these breaks are at. But just to showcase how you can manually set those as something else, if it's meaningful to you, um, we can do that by using the scale y continuous function. So we'll add this after labs, but before the colorblind, or just any time before the theme is really fine. So scale y continuous, make sure to add that plus sign. And then we say breaks equals, and then we do a vector with lowercase c, um, 0, 4. 8, 12, 16. Okay. And now watch what happens with the y-axis here when we do that. Those are those breaks that we manually specified. Okay. You could do the same thing for the x-axis if you wanted uh, using scale underscore x underscore continuous and the breaks option. Okay. You could add that as another layer if you wanted. All right. Okay, so yeah, that reproduced the line chart here. Now we can combine those two plots into one image like this, the faceted scatter plot in the line chart we just created using the patchwork package. Oh, actually we don't have a caption on this. There's no caption at the bottom. We'll get rid of the caption since we're going to combine it with the other ggplot. OK, there we go. All right, so to do this with the patchwork package, and now combining. And so patchwork is really nice in that if you, so you, you can, this is one set of code creating this ggplot. 
you can store this in an object, which is also a big benefit of ggplot uh, visualizations. So if I run this, nothing's actually done. It's just stored in this object that it calls a list. And actually, if you print this to the console, it'll show up in the plots viewer. Um, so that's one benefit of it. Another benefit is you can refer to this object later. Okay, so we can do the same thing with the faceted scatter plot. We can call it like scatter. We still want it to display, we'll print it like that. Same with this one, if we still want it to display, print it like that. So now it, if you run this chunk, it still displays since we put it right here. OK. The patchwork package has this really nice syntax in that, let's say I want this plot to be on top of that scatter plot. You do the name of the ggplot object you stored it in, and then divided by and the other one was scatter. So if I run that, make sure you run it, to store it in there. Now it's stored in scatter. I can do that, ggplot divided by this other one. And if you do that with um, Patrick, it prints them like this. So it doesn't look so great in the preview, but if we knit this, um, it's not so smushed together. Okay, so there we go. Now it's a nice combined plot into one single image. Okay, so that's what the divide by or slash symbol does. It says this plot on top of this one. You could also put them side by side with a, this is called a pipe symbol. It's right above the enter or return key. So it's the same as the backslash button. This is called a pipe, not to be confused with this pipe, which is different, but they're both called that. Uh, this one does them side by side, line chart on the left. Scatter on the right. Okay. And then maybe you want like line chart, scatter. And let's say you had like a third plot. I don't here, but I can do divided by. I think it'll let me do this. Let's see. Yeah. So with this, so this is all from the patchwork package, how we can do this. Not that this plot really makes much sense altogether, but, um, but yeah, sometimes you have like several plots and you want to smush them all together into one image like this. So patchwork package is really useful for that. So here we're just going to be using it like the line chart above the scatter plots. I think that's how it was in the activity. Yeah, line chart above the scatter plots. So we'll knit to that. There we go. There we are. That's using the patchwork package. Pretty neat. Okay. All right, so moving on from that, we'll now look at this side-by-side -side box plot or uh, bar chart, clustered bar chart. I should say, I guess this would be, what would we call this? A faceted bar chart. That's what this would be called. Um, we'll look at that next. So faceted. 
bar charts. All right. So according to John Hopkins Medicine, uh, so large university out of Pittsburgh, does a lot of great medical research. Um, one way to bin or categorize cholesterol levels for all adults generally, which is, eh, should you find criteria that's maybe a bit more tailored to somebody um, based on their gender, age, specifically other factors, their height. Yeah, probably, probably should tailor that more specifically. But if you were to make a really rough set of guidelines like they did, um, you could say someone's total cholesterol is normal if it's less than 200 milligrams per deciliter. Borderline high cholesterol if it's in this range and high cholesterol if it's in this range. Again, oversimplification, but this is a real thing that is um, is done here. Okay. Uh, so let's see. So we can use this code to create this new variable that's a categorical variable about whether someone has normal cholesterol, borderline high, or high cholesterol based on Johns Hopkins definitions, which seem in line with most other places. So we'll just copy this exactly and throw it in a chunk here. And so we'll say, first we create a cholesterol category variable. Okay. So that won't produce any output, but it adds a variable to our data set. So here is the cholesterol categories. You can see sometimes it's missing NA. It's because the total cholesterol for that person was NA. All right. Now we will create a bar chart showcasing that how many people fall in each category in this data set. Okay. And keeping in mind, uh, so we see what the end result will be. A lot of people had very high cholesterol. Uh, the people in this study are, so it, it was a longitudinal study started in 1948. Uh, a lot of people in this study are quite old, uh, a little bit up there in age. So their cholesterols are um, you know, on the higher end happens to the best of us. Everyone, as we age pretty much for the most part, their cholesterol doesn't tend to get better. That's the, the reality. Um, so at first I was like, is there something wrong with this data? There's, uh, it doesn't look great. There's not many people in the normal category, but yeah, it's because this criteria is for everyone. I think 20 and older, it said, but everyone in this study is, is, uh, quite old. All right, so read a bar chart, explain the number of people using geome bar. Okay, so first, um, read a bar chart. Autocomplete. Okay. So to do that, we take this data set, pipe it into ggplot, AES. Okay. So for the bar chart, we specify X and that's it. Just the X variable when we're using geom bar. If you're using geom call, that's a different story when making a bar chart. So a heads up, on being careful whether you're using geom call or geom bar, both of which can be used to make bar plots or bar charts. Um, but in this case, we're making a bar chart. So we're using geom bar. 
a bar plot, which looks very similar, is when the height of the uh, bar is based on a statistic like the mean, the sample mean, or the sample median. That's a bar plot. But when you have the frequency or count for a category, that's a bar chart, which is what we're making here. OK. So, oh yeah, so we just specify X here. So X is the cholesterol category. So this variable that we just made up here, look at the blank canvas, and we have some missing values. We'll, we'll handle that in just a bit. We'll add a geom bar layer just to start. Okay, and we already see some bars. It also shows us the number of missing values, which is important to know, um, but typically we don't show it in a plot like this. Um, you know, it's helpful for us to see if we're doing exploratory data analysis, but maybe not in our final report. Okay. So we will remove missing values for the cholesterol category here, any rows with missing values. And we'll also, like this said, subset to people who are at least 40 years old. Just to be clear that this is only for older people, uh, people above 40 in this data set. Yeah. So we'll add this filter code to do that, to get rid of missing values and to subset to only people at least 40 years old. So we do that before the ggplot another pipe there connecting them. So we added in this filter, which is surrounded by pipes before the ggplot. Okay. This will get rid of those missing values. Also now only people at least 40 years old here. Okay. All right. Recreate this bar chart, this time reordering the categories to show normal, borderline high, and then high using the factor relevel function. Okay, so this function's great. It's from the forecasts package. So right now, the categories are sorted as borderline high, high, normal. This cholesterol category, cholesterol cat variable, is a great example of what we'd call an ordinal categorical variable. There's a particular ordering to the categories. Anytime we have an ordinal categorical variable, we should order the bar chart based on those categories, not based on the height of the bars. Those two things may align, but the ordering of categories for ordinal variables uh, is what takes pre uh, priority. That's what takes priority here. So to do that, to modify the arrangement of the categories, To have it be normal, borderline, high, high. Okay. We will modify in the. So we'll actually, we'll make a new chunk this time to make it more clear. So now we reorder the bars based on the ordering the categories. So in the AES part, we'll use the factor relevel function here. So around cholesterol cat, the factor relevel. And then what we do is afterwards, inside the factor relevel function, we specify the names of the categories with strings separated by commas. So if we want it to be normal, then borderline high, then high, we say normal. And the case matters here. We want to be careful with the case. It needs to match exactly. So make sure it's like capital B borderline lowercase h high, but a capital H here. Okay. Well, I want to be very careful about that. And now if we reproduce that plot, we can see it put them in that particular order. It also messed up the the axis title, but we'll we'll fix that. 
But yeah, speaking of that, fixing the access title, here we'll add a labs layer where we say title, x axis title, y axis title, probably a caption again. Uh, let's do the same caption. I think it's the same caption as before. Yeah. So same caption as before. X axis, we want to say cholesterol level. Y axis, we want to say count with a capital C. Or you could call it frequency. All right, and then the title, distribution of cholesterol levels. And then really we should add, uh, should it should be said in this plot, age 40 and up. Should make that very clear. Actually, if you look at the, like, yeah, let's look at the distribution of ages in this. So we can see the youngest person because it wasn't filtered. It's only filtered up here and not in here. Um, or I guess we could look at it for this. What ends up? And this is 40. Yeah, even still over half the people are over 55 in this, which is why the cholesterols don't look so great. All right. So that's how we used the factor relevel function. Now we can change the coloring of the bars based on the cholesterol level and use a colorblind friendly palette. So just like the box plots, we change the coloring of the inside of the bars using the fill aesthetic. So inside AES, we'll say fill equals um, the cholesterol variable, which is like this. It defaults to these default ggplot colors, but we will add a colorblind friendly palette after the labs function here. My spacing got messed up. So after the labs function, we'll add a scale color periodus D for discrete. Oops. Ah, okay. So this was the fill aesthetic, so it needs to be scale fill periodus D. There we go. We're getting there. OK. Um, then to make the bars have a black outline, because ours are just a solid color, which is OK. Uh, but maybe we want the outline of the bars to be black. We'll say in geome bar, we'll say color equals black. Now they have this nice outline. And then we want to get rid of the legends. We don't want that there at all. So we do that in the theme function. 
using legend dot position equals none. Okay. All right, we're on our way. This again uses the black and white theme. So before the regular theme, we add the complete theme. theme that. Oh, we're getting close. Okay. Um, and then lastly, we want to facet by the sex of the participant, male or female. And so we do that using facet grid again, just like we did before. Um, so we'll copy that layer. Yep, there we go. Just like that. And there we go. OK. So there's our side-by-side -side bar chart showing the number of people with high cholesterol in each group. So you can see here that it looks like um, the females in this data set had, at least based on this criter criteria from Johns Hopkins Medicine, um, higher cholesterols, higher cholesterol levels. Um, right, so might be some more digging into the data there to see why that's the case or if that's expected. Um, at least from a quick Google search on my end, it said that, uh, yeah, old, older females can have uh, higher cholesterol levels. Um, so this didn't seem too surprising, at least based on what I Googled, evidently. OK. Um, so now we will flip this from being a vertical bar chart into a horizontal bar chart. Sometimes that makes it easier to read the category names if you have a large number of categories. Okay. In this case, with three, you can still read it here, but you can imagine if you had like 10 categories, a, a horizontal bar chart would be better. So how we can do that, make this a new layer or a new chunk. So finally, we make the bar chart. We update the vertical bar chart. To Oh gosh, I'm spelling vertical poorly. Okay. All right. So we'll copy this code because it's going to be very similar. Paste that. And then all we need to do is add a, oh, that's a typo. It should say chord flip. So we add, before the themes, we'll add a chord underscore flip layer or coordinate flip. And if you do that, that flips them. Okay. So that's the last part of the assignment there. We made that into a horizontal bar chart. So we looked at, as a recap, we looked at making a faceted scatter plot with smooth lines of best fit, modifying some aesthetics. We looked at creating side-by-side -side faceted bar charts, or I'm sorry, box plots, um, and how to modify different aspects of the text in the plot. Uh, we looked at how to make a line chart based on a statistic summarized uh, across different values of a second variable. We looked at how you can combine plots using the patchwork package. And then finally, we looked at how you can make a faceted bar chart and flip it to be a horizontal bar chart. Well, lots of concepts we covered in ggplot2 today. Um, and that wraps it up for this activity.